finished, uh, pretty well finished chapter 17 of Luke. And at the end of it, uh, we saw that, uh, that, that we finished 18. At the end of it, you know, when Christ talked about the rich young ruler and uh, the, uh, at the end, where the rich young ruler can't give up what he has, but Jesus Christ then proceeds to inform them that he's going to give up his life for, for mankind. And uh, then uh, we come to chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus. And uh, Georgette, did you have your... Yes. Uh, read the story of Zacchaeus for us. Okay. So 19? 19, yeah. 19. And Jesus, having entered, was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Jehoiakim, and he was a chief tax collector. And this man was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd, for he was little of stature. And he ran in front and went up into the sycamore tree in order that he might see him, for he was about to pass through the way, through that way. And when Jesus came upon the place. He looked up and saw him, and said to him, Jacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today it is needful for me to stay in thy house. And he made haste and came down, and he received him rejoicing. But after they saw it, they were all murmuring, saying, With a simple man he doth enter to lodge. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, the half of my possessions, Lord, I give to the poor. And if I exploited anything of anyone by false charges, I give back fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today to, his, to this house salvation came to pass, inasmuch as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which had been lost. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to look again at the difference in attitude yes. uh, between the, the, the people who are there you notice that, of course, that chaos is a publican, so everyone considers him the scum of the earth. Because the publicans were swindlers and cheaters as well. They collected tax for the Romans, but they also added on more tax than was due so they could become wealthy themselves. And we see how uh, the reaction of perhaps the scribes and the Pharisees, the sort of fundamentalists, had immediately condemned Jesus Christ because he had something to do with personally with these sinful people. But when we see that when, when Christ comes to the sycamore tree and he looks up and sees Zacchaeus, he doesn't start accusing him of anything. In this whole story, Jesus Christ never accuses Zacchaeus of anything. He never condemns him, he never curses him, he never calls him a sinner, he never says that everything he's done is wrong or anything like that. He simply says, Zacchaeus, come down because I have to uh, come to your house today. So he comes in and, and they prepare a meal and set before him. And we have no record of anything that Christ says. He was simply present. But he was open-hearted toward this man. And perhaps that's what moves Zacchaeus more than anything, is that here this uh, great prophet, as he would consider him at the time, has been open to him and come and joined him in his house, at his table. And Zacchaeus is so moved and his, his mind is open and he receives grace. So now he's going to completely change his whole life and give half of everything he has to the poor and try to repay the people he knows that he's swindled and cheated. And let's take a look at the difference now in, in how our Lord Jesus Christ approaches these things and how so many so-called Christians approach them and all. Christ makes no railing accusations. He doesn't raise his voice to these people at all. He simply lets it be known that he identifies with them and identifies with their suffering and even identifies with their sin. Of course, he being completely sinless, it's, it's easier for him to identify with specific people's struggle. He's identifying with Zacchaeus' struggle, and he, his very presence opens up Zacchaeus' conscience and his heart, and leads him to completely transform his life. 
Now, I, I've said so many times, but I, I think I'll repeat it again, that it's our harshness and moralism and brutality toward people that we consider sinners, unlike us, of course, who are perfect, uh, that really feeds into modern atheism, because, first of all, it's disgusting to most people. You know, you can get an emotional following immediately, but overall, to the general population, it's rather disgusting. And people turn away from Christ because of the harshness and brutalism that people do all the while while they're saying love. And our Lord Jesus Christ never responds this way to a really sinful person, ever. To a person taken in a real fall, our Lord Jesus Christ is never harsh. He never makes an accusation. He never rails against them. He never calls them names or condemns them. He simply opens his heart to them. And the power of that, like Jesus Christ has a real co-suffering love, and that means that he enters into these people's personal suffering. He enters right into their suffering and never judges or condemns them because of it. And we always forget that the word passion means suffering. It doesn't mean sin. But the things that we suffer from over and over again, sometimes people fall into sin because of the bitterness of the suffering they're enduring. And uh, we, we need to really take stock of that and think about it. And look how easy it is for us to judge each other or for us to uh, start to have a falling out with each other or uh, to try to hurt each other and all. And we do it because of our arrogance and pride, because of our ego. That's the only thing. It's our ego is offended, therefore we become angry and all. And when we look at other people, we condemn the most those people who are the most like us. Because we hate most in others what we fear most in ourselves. Remember I've always said that moral outrage is a form of confession. And you see it time and time again, particularly in the family values people in the United States. You know, this week another senator, uh, state senator had to resign. He was a great family values person, like so many others, who was always condemning and, and accusing other people. And then it turned out that he made a foolish mistake. He accidentally pushed the wrong button on his, on his computer cell phone, and he sent a, a picture of himself. He actually had extramarital relationships going on. He had actually three or four women in his life besides his wife. And he pushed the button and sent accidentally a picture of himself engaged in sexual relations with one of his mistresses to everybody on his mailing list. Just pushed the wrong button. And uh, this, this, um, so th this is one more down. But it's always the people who are involved in family values, thing, the people who are moralists are always the ones who are repeatedly, time after time, exposed for what they actually are, like, like the Duger chap, who was the spokesman for the uh, Family Research Council, an ultra-right-wing family values thing in the United States. It turns out that he'd sexually abused his sisters and his cousin and his cousin's friends, and that he had two paid uh, memberships in, in the uh, Ashley Madison Club and that he had uh, a couple of mistresses on the side. So this is what I mean by moral outrage is a form of confession. We hate most in others what we fear most in ourselves. Whatever we're being tempted by the most is what we hate in other people. And it happens over and over and over and over again. So we see the proof of it constantly before us. And our Lord Jesus Christ never shows any kind of moral outrage. The only time we see him in, in, in uh, what some people interpret as an outrage, I wouldn't, is at the temple when the temple's being defiled. You remember how Christ turned the tables over on these. It wasn't because they were exchanging money. It wasn't because they were selling animals for the sacrifice. That would have been something that had to be done. But it was that they were doing it inside <laughs> the precinct of the temple. And the temple itself was being used 
as a place of merchandise. And of course, money lenders and money changers, or the money changers, generally cheated people anyway when they were exchanging money. But to do it inside the temple precinct, and this was uh, really a demonstration by Christ at the holiness and sacredness of the place of God, of the temple itself, and how people were using it as a, a, a place of merchandise and, and thievery too, because money changers were thieves. But uh, you can't even equate that with his relationship with, with people who are taken in sin or sinful people, like folks in either woman at the well or the the woman at the you know the Samaritan woman, or the uh, the woman taken in adultery, or any of these other people, the centurion who was outside the holy nation, the Canaanite woman who was also not part of the holy nation, and all of the other people that Christ interacted with, and it was always with compassion and mercy that he did it, because he was there to heal, not to punish. But we somehow have become so perverse that we think justice means punishing people. And we don't realize that justice also means restoring a widow's house to her. We don't realize that justice also means making sure that the hungry are fed and that the state should do that as well. I mean, it, we don't mind it coming out of our taxpayers' money. Uh, justice <coughs> is setting matters aright. It is not punishment. It's setting things back in balance. And the Greek word was dikiosini, and in, in old Latin, justitita meant really the same thing as justifying the margins on your computer does, and when you type something, that is balancing them. It didn't have a juridical connotation until late Middle Latin, already into the early Middle Ages. And then, of course, the whole thing was reshaped. But uh, to, to try to follow the example of Jesus Christ here, uh, and then, of course, the righteous ones, the ones who are very, very religious would say, he eateth and drinketh with sinners and publicans. And of course, they weren't interested in healing anyone. They weren't interested in delivering anyone. They were just interested in condemning and where possible punishing. But punishment is uh, the last thing that Jesus Christ wanted to do to anybody. That people will make their own and uh, Christ was not interested in doing that. So Christ came, Christ came for people who knew that they were sinners, who knew that they'd done that of all. Because when you're righteous, you can't repent. What are you going to repent of if you're already righteous, if you think you're righteous? You don't know how to repent. But sinful people can repent and, have their, their, and know that they're sinful and their whole lives can be turned around and changed through repentance. So this is... Um, uh, read the next the, the next uh, section. And as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought that the kingdom of God was immediately about to be shown forth. He said, therefore, a certain well-born man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And having called his own ten slaves, he gave ten minutes to them, and said to them, Transact business while I go and return. But his citizens kept on hating him, and sent forth an embassy after him, saying, We are unwilling for this man to reign over us. And it came to pass, when he returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded those slaves to be called to him, to whom he gave the money, in order that he might find out what each gained by trading. And the first came up, saying, Lord, thy mina gained ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because in a very little thou wast faithful, be thou having authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy mina made five minas. And he said also to this one, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, thy mina which I was keeping laid up in a napkin, for I was afraid of thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up what thou didst not lay down, and reapest what thou didst not sow, and gatherest together where thou didst not winnow. He said to him, Out of thy mouth will I judge thee, O wicked slave. Thou knowest that I am an austere man, 
taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow, and gathering together where I did not winnow. And why didst thou not give my money to the bank? And indeed, after I came, I would have exactly payment from it with interest. And to those standing by he said, Take away the mina from him, and give it to the one who had the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he had ten minas. For I say to you, that to every one who had shall be given, but from the one who had not, even what he had shall be taken away from him. Moreover, those enemies of mine, the ones unwilling for me to reign over them, bring here and slaughter them before me. Yeah, it's, a, 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 of course, a parable, and there's, a, there's some historical things that Christ is basing the parables on. You know, uh, when he talks about the destruction of cities and things like that, he's generally referring to the city of Sepphoris, which was, uh, um, Nazareth was a suburb of the big great city of Sepphoris. And Sepphoris had been invaded and burned down by uh, King Aretas, the king of Nabatea. And uh, in, in, it was a matter of vengeance. It was being rebuilt at the time, and that's why, actually, Joseph is not called a carpenter in Scripture. He's called a craftsman. And so a lot of craftsmen would have been working in, in those three suburbs, three or four suburbs around Sepphoris. They would have been working on the rebuilding of Sepphoris at, at the time of, of Christ's birth. And uh, so that, that likely would be why they were in Nazareth. As a, uh, Nazareth was a, a fairly wealthy town. You know, it wasn't a, a, a poor, miserable little village someplace. It had its own synagogue, which meant that it was uh, a, a fairly well-to-do town. And moreover, it also had a scroll of Isaiah, the prophet. Now, to have a scroll of one of the prophets to be read in the synagogue, there were some very wealthy people in town because those scrolls were extremely expensive. So, uh, there's a whole misconception about what Nazareth was and the whole environment there. The environment there and at uh, Cana was really, uh, people who earned a very good living as craftsmen and workers rebuilding the city of Sepphoris. The Sepphoris was previously the capital. Of course, Herod built a new capital and named it after himself, but Sepphoris had been the capital before. Uh, so the, uh, many of these parables are really based in historical things that people would have actually known about, and they would have kind of put them together in their own minds because they were really fairly contemporary with them. Uh, but here is one thing about the, the, what the Last Judgment consists in, in it. And that is that we've, people have been given gifts of grace, have been given the grace of the Holy Spirit. If they don't do anything with it, if you just wall it up inside yourself, then nothing will develop or come from it. And Jesus Christ, really what the Last Judgment consists in is that what we seem to have will be taken from us. The grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and all these things that we seem to have will simply be taken from us and will, will, will leave us in darkness in it. So this is um, uh, what, what we need to gain from that is just what we talked about a little bit in the sermon today, that when you receive from God, this grace and the inner peace of the grace of the Holy Spirit, that those things have to be projected outward and they have to be shared and they have to be given, not by some kind of preaching or bullying or, or uh, some of the things we see some of our people doing, but really, first of all, by being lived in our own life and also by a kindness and generosity of spirit, not always generosity of money. That's it, you know, somebody can do that, but without a generosity of our spirit, our generosity of our forgiveness, the generosity of our nature uh, toward people, we're really not investing the, the grace that Jesus Christ has given us. And we're not going to return it tenfold or fivefold or whatever. We're going to be like the person with the one kopeck or the one mina who returned nothing except what he'd originally received. So let's put it in, a, in, a, in another way that's a kind of a parable, is that God has invested in us 
grace. And he's invested the Holy Spirit in us. And he expects a return on the investment. And that's, uh, that's what we as Christians need to think about. And that return on the investment, again, it's not running around preaching and haranguing people. And, you know, knocking on people's doors with little booklets and things. Uh, we, we, it has to be something that manifests in our actual life itself and in our inner relationships with other human beings. And the opportunity arises to discuss faith and discuss religion and discuss Christ. If people have seen the signs of Christ within us, <clears throat> when we begin to explain Christ, it resonates because they've seen us behaving in a way that's consistent with what it is we want to teach. And this is what happens now with our right-wing fundamentalists here and these family values people. Over and over and over again, we see that they're teaching but not living something. And, you know, we have a, a, a family values. Really, family values is loving one another within the family and trying to do your best that everybody within the family is, is, has some kind of happiness or some kind of joy in each other. Raising, successfully raising a child who's going to be an honest and earn an honest living is success. It doesn't matter whether they're a ditch digger or a, 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 a brain surgeon. If they earn an honest living and live an honest life, the parents have been successful in raising them. Success isn't measured by what they do, but by the quality of how they do it. And, and this is one of the greatest challenges of our, of our age, or it, perhaps any age, but perhaps even more in our age than other ages, is raising children who are kind, who are, who are considerate, who are gentle, who have higher thoughts about mankind and about humanity. Who sometimes, uh, but above all, who are honest and earn an honest living. In it. The, these are the, the, the great accomplishments, the greatest accomplishments that a human being could possibly have is raising a decent child. In it. I don't see any greater accomplishment for any person than that in life. So this, uh, uh, when we have something invested in us though, we need to, if you want family values, take care of your own family. Don't worry about other people's families. Don't go around dictating to other people or brutalizing people with how you think they should raise their children or how, what kind of family you think they should be. Take care of your own family and worry about it. And if you set a good example taking care of your own family, then you can have an impact on somebody else. But if you don't, then they're going to see through you and see the heresy, see your own hypocrisy and bigotry. And that's, that's real family values, taking care of your own family. Setting an example by taking care of your own family. That, uh, it's rather like trying to export democracy. It doesn't work everywhere. And your method for raising children might not work for somebody else raising children or raising a family. And your view of a family might not be everybody else's view of a family. So, okay, I think that's where we want to go with it, really, today. Does anybody have any questions, though? So, you know, I always, I always hope somebody will have questions. I wonder what um, <clears throat> what the public and what drove into Susie Jews, like what, what made him go into the crowd, like he was looking forward to well, you know, that someone's famous at his table or he was just actually was looking for something that was that uh, he was seeking a long time before and it wasn't something, it wasn't money because obviously he had lots of it. Yeah. Is anywhere saying what the Holy Father is saying uh, about? No, but you know what? Christ was known for being, I mean, people who didn't go the whole details thought, well, here's a great prophet that's come above us, and he's teaching, and he obviously has the Word of God because he heals people. So perhaps he's looking for a meaning to his life because, you know, life has a, that much meaning to him. He's gotten very wealthy. But everybody in town hates him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, who knows, maybe he hates himself for what he's done. Because everybody has a conscience. And sometimes you can hide from it in this life. 
Sometimes you can't. One thing's for certain, when you go forth from this life, there's no possible way that you can uh, silence your conscience. It's going to testify against you. But even in this life, our conscience testifies about it. And I, I rather think that Zacchaeus had heard something about Christ and that his conscience was, was tormenting him a bit. So he was looking to see if there was something there that, that would lift him up. You know, it's more important, in many ways, it's more important to have a healthy conscience in this life than to have a healthy body. Because an unhealthy conscience can torment us far more than physical illness at times. You know, the inner human suffering that we endure can be far worse than our physical suffering. And, and the conscience can torment us a great deal. And we try to seek for a peaceful conscience. And uh, so I, that, that seems to me he really wanted to see. I mean, the story is great because he's too small to see over the crowd, so he wants to see Christ who he is so badly that he climbs up in a tree to see him. He's looking for something. He's trying to search for something. And I suspect it's peace for his conscience, a kind of inner peacefulness of some kind, and how to make himself right with his conscience. And, and I suspect that because I've heard enough confessions over the last 40 years to know what so, so many times what people are actually seeking. And it's really seeking peace with their own conscience and kind of peace within themselves. So I suspect that was what drove that case. It's what can drive any of us because we all at some time, you know, our conscience is against us, testifying against us. And to reconcile our heart with our conscience is part of our greatest struggle in this life. Anybody else? Is that what it uh, drives us for confession, our conscience? Well, you know, it drives us to confession unless we're just being driven to confession by habit. Or the sort of thing you have to do. But very often our conscience does drive us to confession. And that's why I say one, one of the most important aspects of, of confession is trying to help people forgive themselves. Trying to help people find peace with their own conscience. That's why people don't forgive themselves, their conscience is still, you know, chastising them. And yet, when you receive God's forgiveness, you, you must forgive yourself also. Because the servant is not greater than the master, and uh, as he says, who art thou to judge another man's servant? You're not your own servant, you're Christ's servant. So how do you judge Christ's servant? Which is you, uh, to, to come to forgive yourself. Because to set your conscience at peace. That's one of the greatest things about confession, setting your conscience at peace. That's why some people will come to the monastery and have two or three hours of confession. So, and it's not that they have that many sins or something, but that we, we have to work together to try to bring their conscience to peace. Michael? Well, is it then when Jesus says, do what, don't do what they do, but do only what they say. Mm -hmm. Is he really attacking the doings or the hypocrisy? Well, uh, both, I suppose, because um, the, the thing is that the, the, the Pharisees can, can teach what's proper, mm -hmm. but then they turn around and they don't do what's proper. So I said, you know, do, do, what they, do what they teach because they're trying to impress you by teaching the right thing. But don't, don't do what they do, don't follow their actions, <coughs> because then you'll be doing just exactly the opposite. Yeah. It, is, it is hypocrisy, and hypocrisy is one of the great marks of, of hyper-religious people, or, or too, people who are too religious. Now, I never trust anybody who's too religious, there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And if there's, there's something just not right about a person who's too religious, especially when they've got a lot of moralisms. You know, moralism and morality are not the same thing. And generally, moralism is something you tell other people to do, but don't do yourself. And well, so that, that's what he's saying. You know, they'll, they'll tell you the Ten Commandments, and they'll read the Ten Commandments to you, but then they go out and violate most of them. <laughs> and, um, and of course, you know, money is an idolatry. And if you, you can put that above God, and it's, it's all the same as if you were worshiping Baal or Molech or something, have no other gods before me, and that includes your money and your wealth, and your, and your 
task or education any of these things. And if you can have that as an idol before you in place of God, anytime. So it, it's just perfectly clear. He's saying, okay, they sit in Moses' seat, so whatever they bid you to do, do it. In other, in other words, when they when they teach you the Ten Commandments or something like that, well, go ahead and follow those things. But for heaven's sakes, don't imitate their behavior. But you'll find that with all right-wing moralists. They'll tell you all kinds of things, and then all of a sudden you find out they're doing exactly the opposite. They're not doing any of this stuff. It's like a person who's fanatical about telling other people to keep the fast. Uh, I've had at least three instances in the past where we had a, a fanatical clergyman who harrying people about keeping the fast, but, but all three of them were caught by some of the very people breaking the fast during Great Lent. That's, that's the sort of thing that uh, Christ is talking about. So, yes? Could we agree that psychological analysis was taken from Christian confession, the idea, from the idea of Christian confession? Mm -hmm. I mean, Freud, who was first? Oh, well, yeah, because uh, they, they were looking at it, probably trying to look at a deeper understanding of, of the mind. Uh, I, I think the fathers had a profound understanding when they taught the, the prayer for the guarding of the mind. I'm, I'm astonished at how the steps they gave us are precisely the steps that actually take place in the brain and all. And I think uh, people were kind of fascinated by it. You know, St. Anthony the Great is the one who co coined the phrase uh, uh, psychotherapy. That was, an, that was a, already a tradition in the Orthodox Church when the psychiatrist came along and started trying to form psychiatry and, and a kind of psychology. And it, it, uh, I mean, the Greeks had a kind of empirical psychology already that was already developed. Uh, and um, his name slips my, slips my mind right now. Uh, the, the one who was famous for originating it. Uh, but uh, to actually look at it in a more scientific way, that's what Freud and the others were doing, trying to look at it in a scientific way. And of course they were just sort of breaking ground, and um, breaking new ground. But sometimes we have problems, it, it becomes problematic, like the behaviorists, for example. Mm -hmm. And behaviorism was a catastrophe. It did an enormous amount of harm. And finally, it was abandoned as being just mechanical. harmful and mecha too mechanical, yeah, and harmful as well. Because it's, it's the same when, when we look at all of these aspects. You know, if we look with a, 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 a serious minded science and research, and now, of course, we can go steps further because we have functional MRI. So you can actually watch what's going on in the brain while certain things are happening, or while certain ideas or things are, are passed before a person. And so we can follow the brain patterns from it. So now we know an enormous amount more than we used to know. But uh, you people are very slow to adapt and accept new knowledge. It's unfortunate. I, I think I mentioned once before that some of our more unsober clergy. Uh, one of the priests had written a book, uh, some Protestant ministers had written the same thing, that there's no such thing as depression, that it's always only a demonic temptation. And so that's a good way to kill people, because depression is sometimes the first symptom of some very serious illnesses, the first symptom of a brain tumor, the first symptom of Wilson's disease. The same that one of the earliest symptoms of celiac disease, and uh, it could be a, 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 a brain damage or of a cyst growing in the brain. Many of these things can create clinical depressions. So uh, it, it's very, very dangerous for people to talk about things they really know absolutely nothing about. And yet we can we can take, a, you know, the I think the Broadman 25 area of the brain has a, a despair and depression loop in it. I mean, it's a whole, there's a whole loop that follows in there, and depression and despair can, be, can develop, and uh, we just follow that loop in the brain. And it has to be treated. 
if you don't treat clinical depression, then the uh, um, the, hypo, you know, the hypocampi start to atrophy, and it's irreversible. You can't reverse it once it's been done. So you know that this. Uh, so we have a lot of um, problems with people who want to be psychologists but aren't really scientific about it. They don't have any real empirical knowledge and experience with it. So I, I think what some, some of the early psychiatrists were doing with theoreticians was actually trying, trying to find out as best they could what was actually going on instead of, you know, superstitions. And they really uh, made some, some headway and some, took some ground. But now with fMRI and, and other tools that we have, uh, we can really make a great deal of advancement, and we have. Even though more superstitious people refuse to accept it. A lot of it, but we do know more what's going on in the brain, yeah. and it can say it can keep us from destroying other people if we pay attention to it. Um, I mean, and the early psychiatrists were the ones who started this whole this whole development toward having an actual knowledge of what's actually going on in the brain. So you know, however, the shortfall might have been in some of the earliest ones. They were still breaking ground, and they were trying to discover. A way to help people more. That's what they're really interested in. I mean, Sigmund Freud wasn't just doing it out of curiosity. He also thought they could genuinely help people. And uh, at least he started the scientific ex exploration of it. Of course, he made a lot of mistakes because he didn't have any of them. First of all, he didn't have any of the the tools that we have now. And secondly, he was new. He was the trailblazer. So of course, he made mistakes. But anyway, he got it started, he got the ball rolling, and other people took up from there. So anyway, uh, one more question if we have any, so otherwise.